the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, sometimes it's so important to just slow down and stop. And some people would say smell the roses. But I'm talking about just take a bird's eye view at the rush, rush, and the hubbub of what's going on today. Well, yeah, there's a number of issues which we could address today that simply jump off the pages of the world's newspapers. Right. And, and you're right, it's almost a tyrannical urgency with news and data. For instance, you've got unrest in the Middle East. You've got the Siskel and Ebert giving two thumbs down on the opinion piece on Mohammed. Right. Conflict between China and Japan. I mean, this is tragic, but a U.S. ambassador to Libya drugged through the streets and murdered. It's the first time we've had violence like that since 1979. And, of course, the White House reacts with the same Carter-esque leadership. Right. And this is no joking matter, this last point. But, again, all of these things, we feverishly check our inboxes to see if anything of a critical nature, very important, awaits us. We scan the news. We get sucked into the news media's sensationalist titles and, frankly, one-sided content. And again, all of that is driven by this breaking news flare, as if all of it was a matter of life and death. Well, and David, it's more of a Twitter mentality. I was reading an article the other day that talked about electronic media actually make you dumber. And the article was pointing out that research shows that even though we have more information available to us all the time, we're really not ruminating on anything. We're not having to actually create enough friction to learn something. We just know the little, the, you know, the top points of every Twitter. So my Twitter response to that question would be, duh. <laughs> now, sometimes it's nice to pause and reflect. I took the opportunity to reread Vaclav Havel's book, Summer Meditations. That's a recently. great book. You gave that to me as a gift a couple of years ago, and it's great. It's refreshing to see the picture of a statesman. Right. He was sucked into politics and a role of leadership in Czechoslovakia. Two things he had no aspirations for. This was with the fall of communism in that area famous playwright who we are very outspoken in his views but had no aspirations politically and again this is something that in this political season is sorely absent with two men who rather enjoy power of course we should always be cautious of anyone that craves power the politicians today are playing the game of sort of death by a thousand cuts innumerable ad hominems message manipulations absent frankly, and this is what's tragic, absent from the field is someone like Havel. Sort of the citizen leader, that this is a man who was actually doing other things and he got thrust into the position. It reminds me of a lot of the patriots or the founding fathers of America. Okay, These men were successful in other areas and sometimes they were hesitant leaders. And circumstance threw them into the fray. I'd encourage all of our listeners to read this particular book, Summer Meditations, if for no other reason than to recall that there can be good people in politics. And it's usually by accident that they're there, not by some political calculus. Yeah, so David, what we're talking about is reflection. What we're talking about is actually ruminating on the things that are important. I'll give you an example. Okay, my daughter and I were at the Louvre Museum last year in Paris. And you know, you look at the Mona Lisa, and it really is an amazing masterpiece. You know, it's it really is. It's smaller than I think what most people think. But if, in your imagination, you could walk up to it with a blindfold on and have your nose against the painting and open your eyes, you wouldn't see the Mona Lisa. You'd see a smear of brown. You'd see a little bit of red, maybe some blue, maybe different tans. But you wouldn't see the picture. The only way you can really appreciate a masterpiece is to step back 15, 20, 25 feet and just ruminate on it and look at it. And I think that's what you're talking about right now is summer meditations, but in all areas of your life. Right. So, I mean, the, the topic at hand today is not politics, it's, and it's not actually Vaclav Havel. It's just that we should, regardless of the area of life in question, occasionally pause and reflect, consider our lives in that larger or longer context and determine what our goals and aspirations are. That is personally, that is with our families, that is in the context of our communities. This is what in our family we refer to as reverse engineering. Okay. And in other words, imagine a state of affairs in the future that you consider to be intriguing or ideal and work backwards from that. What would that look like if I were already there? How did I get there? Exactly. So now in, in working backwards from that, you know what the first step is. The second step is. The third step is. 
progressively towards those goals. Well, and what's fascinating, David, is I've been around your family now for 25 years. This is how your family operates. I mean, this firm is a two-generational family operation. There's not been any corporation. It's it's within the family, and you all, you and your dad especially, sit down and actually have powwows on a regular basis looking backwards from the future. I'm not a 95-year-old man, but, but reflecting back, as a 95-year-old, and again, on my imaginary successes or failures, and reverse engineering, again, this is a sort of thought experiment or even a pre-preparation, if you will, right. but you look back at what it took to successfully build your business or raise your family, instilling in your kids the kinds of character they need to live skillfully, or maintain and grow in intimacy with your spouse, invest successfully through the decades. Again, it doesn't matter what the topic too often we're reacting to what life throws at us and forgetting that you have to be deliberate to get from here to there is a deliberate process not an accidental one and you have to give it some thought well and David one of the things that you've pointed out to all of us as we work with our clients is to get them thinking about what if what they owned was free okay now how do you do that how do you make something your life savings actually turn out to be a free investment right so what you're talking about is really having a cost basis which is zero in everything that you own and again this is just one area of life again it's it's not even the most important area of life but as we reflect on our finances and look at our long-term goals how do you orient the allocations that you have and the decisions that you have whether it's today or longer term three five seven ten years out are you pre-preparing? Are you looking ahead? Are you reverse engineering that success to take into account a longer picture? Which actually is very helpful from removing the tensions and pressures that the news media puts on you today to do something now. What you're saying is instead of trying to make the quick hit profit-wise, what you want to have is an investment that trends up enough to where it actually pays for itself over time and then transitions to the family on down the line. Sure. So with patience and sort of the proper approach to investing, you can do do this when you look at your investment assets and have every one of them that you own for free. You've extracted your initial investment completely. What remains there on the balance sheet, you own for free. It's something that takes time. So, well, give me an example of that. Think about a rental house. You paid a hundred thousand dollars for it. Once your rental income from the property exceeds the price you paid for the property, you have extracted out your original investment and unarguably you have a free house with great cash flow and competitive pricing power in terms of rents that's, that's just to illustrate one asset but allow time to progress instead of looking at real estate and saying I'm buying today selling tomorrow for 20 percent gain what about allowing that property to pay for itself you begin to take on a different view when that asset is fully paid for well, David, let me give you an example of something that just happened yesterday. Okay, I have a client that purchased from me back in 1995 15 coins for $588 a coin. These were gold MS-62 Liberty coins. And she was talking to me about how she now is at a point in her life where she needs to raise some cash. So 15 coins 15 years ago or 17 years ago at 588 a coin came to $8,820. Now, the strange thing was, and this was not purposely, we had to both laugh at this, but when she sold five of the 15 coins back to me for $1,764 a coin, it came to the dollar 8,820. So she got 10 coins for free. She started with 15, sold me back five for exactly the amount that she had purchased the 15 and for. And she keeps two-thirds of her portfolio at a zero-cost basis. And this is not a lady trained in economics. This was just someone who was moved to do the right thing at the right time. But it does take time, and it does yeah. take reflection to be able to set in motion whether it is precious metals, whether it is real estate, whether it is an equity portfolio. I mean, think of that. A stock that you've owned in your IRA for the last umpteen years. However many years. In it's appreciated by 100%. It's appreciated by 50%. Selling down to the portion where what you keep, you own outright and don't have your original investment dollars in it. It allows you to move on to greener pastures, do more interesting things or different things, more diversified things across all asset classes, and you really don't have your skin in the game, although you still have full benefit of the exposure. Well, and don't you think this is an important concept, too? And you've said this many times. Don't fall in love with your investments. You can have loyalty to friends. You can have loyalty to family. Do not have loyalty to one particular investment class. Mainly because whatever you fall in love with in terms of an asset, it will never love you back. Right. <laughs> it will never love you back. 
that's certainly something that we have to keep in mind. And I, I don't want to border on the heretical here because today we are in a bull market in precious metals and growth abounds. And sure. you know, what more do you need to know? Buy it, keep it, love it. But that's the point. Any seasoned investor knows you don't fall in love with an asset. It won't love you back. Right. That's not to say that we suggest selling gold today. It's just to say that in this pre-preparation mode, whatever asset class it is, what we'd love to see clients arrive at, the destination ahead, is with a portfolio, whether it is equities, whether it is real estate, whether it is precious metals, that you own with a zero cost basis. Well, and this is where looking back from a 95-year or 105-year perspective really helps. Now, we've talked for years to our clients about a ratio, a specific ratio that seems to work with gold that we call the Dow to gold ratio or the gold to Dow ratio. And what you're basically doing is taking the Dow Jones Industrial Average and simply dividing it by the price of gold. How many ounces of gold does it take to buy the Dow? Now, we started at the peak of this Dow and at the bottom of the gold market at about a 42 to 1 ratio here about 12 years ago. Now, we're in the 7 range. You know, if you want to expound a little bit, there is a range where we start actually talking about an exit strategy on gold. We're not suggesting that a series of liquidations or reductions of precious metals is the right thing to do today. We're right. not saying that at all. Quite the opposite. Relative to the Dow, we see an additional five-fold five -fold increase in purchasing power. That's that free years. investment. Right. So, yes, we're comfortable adding ounces at these levels. But it is with the idea that we're not in love with any asset class in particular. And ultimately, we want a solid precious metals portfolio that we own and even pass on intergenerationally. And we look at our cost basis and we say, oh, we've already extracted our initial investment one, two, three times over. And this very significant, substantial part of our asset base, which remains in precious metals, we have zero original invested dollars in. So who cares if it goes up or down? This is the part that you basically call the insurance hedge for the rest of the portfolio. What we're saying is that when we reach the end of a bull market in precious metals, and frankly, we're not smart enough to know when that is, then you had better be prepared to let someone else own ounces. And this is really the issue. To make this crystal clear, we're as bullish as ever on gold and silver with a positive road ahead of us, a growth-oriented trend for a minimum three to five years, if not more, right. depending on Fed leadership and the policies du jour, you need to appreciate the difference between gold as an appreciating asset set beside any other asset in a bull market. And this is really, again, just to diverge a little bit from this conversation about having zero-cost basis assets in your on your balance sheet. Gold, when it begins to appreciate at the tail end of a bull market, it's being driven by fear. And not greed. Yeah, not it's greed. The, the two drivers, David, uh, greed is one of them. And yes, greed can, uh, like the tech stock boom in the late 90s, that was a greed-driven market. Nobody purchased tech stocks out of fear. Maybe, maybe fear out of letting the neighbors outperform them, but it really wasn't true fear. When people are panicking. And that's the problem yeah. with owning gold in the late stage of a bull market, which is still many years ahead of us. Right. But the idea of maybe liquidating ounces... And moving to an, an asset base in precious metals, which you hold at a zero-cost basis, you'll be very hesitant to do that yeah. on the basis of ownership and, again, sort of the spirit of the age being one of fear. This is an insurance policy that you own, and it's paying. And why? Why would you, for instance, get rid of your fire insurance when there is a prairie blaze at moving towards your neighborhood. That seems absolutely insane. You'd be out of your mind to do that. That is just to set the emotional tone for the decisions ahead. Right. The idea that taking some money off the table at some point in the future will be more difficult than you know unless you have imagined doing it ahead of time. Well, and David, I want to make sure that I point out, you know, if there was that prairie fire coming and, and if we were to liken it to the dollar system, if the dollar were really failing and people really were fearful that they were going to lose all their assets, we're not suggesting that a person and jump back into a currency that's failing. What we're suggesting is you go from something of value to something else of value. It may be stocks, maybe bonds. Let me back up a little bit, though, David. All right. We have been utilizing for years something we call compounding ounces, just within the metals themselves, using this concept of zero-cost basis, where let's say you start a portfolio with 50% gold, 50% silver. 
if the ratios are balanced at the time and one goes out of balance, one metal becomes unusually cheap or expensive relative to the other. A move between metals can also establish this zero-cost basis. So are you a gold bug or are you a silver bug? Either one. It doesn't matter. And that's right. the point. You don't have to fall in love with either one if there is a compelling value story being told where one is over valued and one is undervalued. Right. Just to put that in real world numbers, today the gold silver ratio is at 51 to 1. Right. 51 to 1 in a larger context of being 80 to 1 on the very high side when silver was selling for about $4.50, a very neglected asset. And as low as 15 to 1. And that's within the last 40 years or so, the 15 to 1. Right. And I think it's important to note that the CPM group has done their silver study as of this last year. The in ground extraction, current extraction by miners, is coming out at a 12 to 1 ratio. Which means silver is undervalued relative to gold still. It is undervalued because, again, where are we at today? 51. North of 50. Yeah. And, and the average through time, this is worth noting, the average through time on either a 100 year or 200 year basis is closer to 30. Right. So at a 50 ounce to one ounce of gold ratio, you realize that you're getting a bunch of silver ounces for free. You're getting silver ounces for free. In fact, about 40% more silver for free than if the ratio was trading at 30 to one. Or the, or the flip side of looking at that is buying silver at 50 to one and letting someone else own it at 30 to one, you've just improved your position by 40%. Well, David, I should say in the last two years, that's exactly what we did. We had a number of clients that had purchased between between 60, 70, 80 to 1, even 50 to 1. And as silver rose to close to $50 an ounce, and gold at that time was 1500 you take $1,500 divided by 50. You get about 30, 31 to 1 is where we got to. And a lot of our clients had already sold some of their silver back into gold and are now, crazily enough, swinging back into silver now that the ratio favors silver. Right, and, and that's, again, where if you take a sanguine view to all of your resources and say... What I really would like to see is the purchase of things when they're inexpensive or a good value and the liquidation of things when they're expensive or right. overpriced. What you have to do is allow yourself enough time, allow yourself enough time to see these cycles play through. Because, again, this comes back to sort of the tyranny, the urgent that we face today. Whether it's Kramer or anyone else on the television today, you feel like there is something which you have to do in the next two nanoseconds. And if you don't, you are left in the dust. David, when I get back from lunch, I, I take a late lunch in the afternoons and Kramer's on the TV as I walk in the door. You've got a big screen TV there. Kramer's got his pink shirt on. He's got his sleeves rolled up. And he's just screaming about the next nanosecond, exactly what you're talking about. you got to do this. you got to do that. To the point where you could see where a person would feel like they're missing the boat if they're not doing something that television is telling them to do. But if you could, instead of thinking about the next quarter, think about the next quarter century right. and begin to allow yourself the flexibility of saying, I'm interested in lots of things, whether it is real estate and rental income, whether it is equities, and again, inexpensive valuations in the equity space, whether it is precious metals, does it make sense to buy silver when it's at 4 5 $6 an ounce, $7 an ounce, $20 an ounce, $30 an ounce, on its way to 120 Right. It does. Does it make sense to be buying silver at $300 an ounce? God forbid that we should see that, because it tells you a lot about the state of inflation that we would be living in. But at what point do you want to be coming into those markets, and what what point do you want to be exiting those markets? For us, as a family, we look at things not only from an intergenerational standpoint, but truly with the next quarter century in mind, not the next several months or next quarter in mind. Well, and David, I think about a conversation you had just this morning with someone who was very, very successful in his past real estate enterprises. And what he did as we got close to the top of the real estate bubble is he became very, very liquid. And he put quite a bit into gold and is waiting out the real estate market with the intention of going back into the very thing that he knows the most about. But he's being patient. He's taking the longer-term perspective. He's not in love with just one asset class. Yeah. Even though he has built 40,000 homes, even though he has built 40,000 homes, and this is his area of expertise, right. having a strong allocation to gold makes a lot of sense today. But do you realize that as he gets to that point where his investment has not only fully paid for itself, but done so one, two, three times, right. he then is in the place where he can extract those gains and go back to play in the field where he's most comfortable, where he built his fortune in the first place, building homes. Well, and I'm going to shift gears slightly, but it's got a similar type of metaphor to it. Okay, When you were talking about playing in your own field, 
I'm an American. I've never been threatened with invasion. I've never had a problem moving money from one place to the next. But we're seeing America change. And talking about playing in your own field, our investors right now are also looking at spreading some of the wealth out outside of the borders. We were talking again this morning with someone about a, a position in Toronto, Canada, a position in Zurich, Switzerland, and a position you know, in Delaware, uh, just areas that you can store the metals. And something that I should also bring up is we were talking about trading gold to silver. In these areas, they can trade inter-between themselves if indeed there is a swap or there's a compounding ounces event that's necessary. We're not in a circumstance today that would necessitate having a part of your resources outside the United States, but it is prudent to look ahead and say, what circumstances might there be three, five, seven, ten, twenty 10, 20 years out right. where you do want to preposition, you do want a geographic diversification? Now, back to the issue of, of having a portfolio that over a longer period of time you have been able to extract the original principal investment and move it on to other investments. This is really what we're, we're talking about. It takes time. It takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of deliberation. But one of the beautiful things is that it does allow you to relax. There is no sense of urgency. There is no sense of urgency. There's nothing that must be done today because cycles and secular trends evolve over a very long period of time. And what we saw with the equity cycle in the 1966 to 1982 period was a slow bleed where you basically had equities doing nothing. And you could argue, well, then they should have been a value. We, they had just growth ahead. But they did nothing for a long period of time. And inflation, then at the tail end of that cycle, began to chew away, chew away, chew away at the equity market. And it discouraged equity investors to where, by the time we got to 1980, 1982, you had such a demoralized class of investors that no one wanted to own equities anymore. And ironically, that is also when the demoralized equity investor, because of inflation, because of politics, because of, frankly, the Russians invading Afghanistan, all of these factors put into one bundle. You had investors all around the world wanting to own gold. Well, and David, it reminds me of a philosophy that your family's followed for many years, the triangle philosophy. Okay, you're not talking about having patience and just holding on to one asset class and thinking that this works. It's the triangle. You have the base of the triangle in precious metals. You have the left side of the triangle in growth and income, which is stocks, bonds, what have you. You have the right side of the triangle in some sort of cash equivalent. And granted, in reallocation of that triangle, because one side is going to invariably grow at a different rate than the other, and you have to redistribute at some point. But strangely enough, that makes you look like a genius of long-term timing, doesn't it? But it, you have to have long-term timing in play. You, you have to have a time frame for you, for your family, which encompasses more than the next quarter, but more like the next quarter century. Let's look at each one of those kind of in brief, because the undervalued, particularly in a period where there's concern over inflation, is that one-third that might be allocated to cash. You say, well, it's just in the crosshairs. It's sitting there waiting for Ben Bernanke to manage it to nothing. And if you were listening to last week's commentary, that's certainly the field that we gave. Are we concerned about inflation? Yes. Have we crossed the Rubicon and, and are we moving towards an inflationary outcome? Yes. But don't you for a second ignore the fact that we've gone through a 30 to 40 year credit boom. There has been so much lending and so many bets made. And the other side of that is that many of those bets will have to be unwound. Sure. There is no clear-cut inflationary outcome, deflationary outcome, either or. So you don't get rid of all your cash, we you have, just hedge it with gold. And we have both and in this yeah. scenario. The question is, when you see a deleveraging event, a deflation occur, let's say, for instance, let's say, for instance, you were very liquid and you just watched a 50% decline in the value of Florida real estate. And you are fully invested elsewhere, and there's nothing you can do. The opportunity cost of not having cash is that you cannot, you cannot consider an asset class that has just been deflated, deleveraged, and is now suffering in terms of its price at very low levels. You got to pay your bills too, Dave. Oh, of course, and of that's course. cash as well. Well, and so moving to the precious metal section, I mean, again, no one knows exactly how things play out over the next three to five years, we do know that the world's central bankers are committed to inflation, inflation, inflation. Sure. It's all they can do. But we should not assume that they control the universe. They believe they do. But we should not assume that they actually do. And there will be areas, pockets where we see massive inflationary consequences and pockets where we see nothing of the sort. We tried to discuss that in the last couple of weeks, just distinguishing between precious metals and things like aluminum, copper, and iron ore. Sure. E even in your geographic diversification, as you look around the world, 
world, places that you can invest, understand how critical some of those commodities are. 15 to 20 percent of an input economically to a place like Chile comes from copper. So if copper prices begin to fail, guess what happens to the Chilean economy? Oops. And so there is this sense in which you can bet on an inflationary outcome, and if you're betting too broadly, painting with too broad a brushstroke, you can still get hurt very badly. Well, and speaking of that, too, we're not talking about leveraging anything, leveraging cash, leveraging gold, leveraging stock, because that can wipe out a long-term plan in a very short time. Let's go through sort of a full cycle, though, where gold is appreciated. We're at the end of a bull market, and it's time to sort of reallocate, bolster, if you will, the portion of your your perspective triangle, which needs to be supplemented more with cash, and also the equity side, which, again, relative to the gold and the growth that you've seen in the gold and silver portion of your portfolio, is now proportionally too large. That diversification or reallocation process, as it occurs, what you're anticipating is the next 15 to 20 years of growth in a secular trend within equities. And also, in terms of the value of cash, just having that liquidity there to buy other assets opportunistically or to serve your family needs, your community needs, your church needs, whatever it is, you have the resources liquid and available to be an agent of change there within your own context. Well, and two observations, Dave. One is that you don't have to be right on the timing exactly because you're still utilizing the triangle concept. Let's say you move to equities a little early. Well, okay, you've got gold. You've got cash. You've maybe moved to equities a little early, probably a little better than too late, but one way or another, you still have some balance. The second observation, though, and this is the one that I think we need to continually rehearse with our clients, a gold bug who's watched his gold go up five times, six times, maybe tenfold, a gold bug is going to be hard. It's going to be like pulling teeth to get him to sell some of that at the right time to go over into that equity side, which he actually was hedging against for all those years. And I think when you get down to it, we're really talking about some basics in terms of character that make or break an investor. Mm. And if an investor does not embrace these things, they can only be lucky. They will not be successful in the long run. And only being lucky means that on the first day, just like someone who goes to Vegas, hits the craps tables, and wins the first round, feels like they're invincible. But the reality is, they're nothing of the sort. They were just lucky. And, And when you involve two principles, patience on the one hand and humility on the other, you're setting yourself up to manage assets, again, not for the next quarter, but the next quarter century, with much greater success. Well, and David, it reminds me of my first real investment pain. I was a toy store manager going to college. I had worked all year long for a relatively small bonus, and I thought I'd buy gold with it because gold looked pretty good. This was in the mid-'80s, and I had someone talk me into leveraging a copper contract, and he said, no, no, you got to look at the chart. Just go ahead and put all this money into a copper contract. Well, I was lucky, and within days, it had doubled in price, and I thought, my gosh, why in the world am I a retail toy store manager going to college? I could just do this. So I took all the proceeds, went into sugar, and I think soybeans, and of course, made yeah. your donation. <laughs> I made my donation. But see, I had no plan. I had an idea. I had no plan. And I just went to the next expert. Now, I'll bring this up because your family has been giving this type of advice for 40 years. So for a person who wants to understand more about this zero cost basis on investments, I have to encourage them to call us and give you a call, David. You are open to talking to any of our clients anytime. The idea that we partner with clients over a long period of time and aid them in the decision-making process, even assist them in getting that done, It's what we've done. It's what we'll continue to do. It's what we look forward to doing, regardless of the business cycle, whether it is harrowing, dangerous, treacherous, or particularly enjoyable and fun and and, and a little easier, perhaps. Our work never ends because, again, when you explore for value, when you're in the process of overturning every rock to uncover that which represents the greatest value out of the whole universe of assets that you can invest in, We want to bring other things that into this equation of successful investing over a long period of time are essential. Diligence and hard work. Diligence and hard work along with humility and patience go a long way in the investment process. Humility is represented in that perspective triangle by saying there's a lot more about the universe and about the investment world that we cannot know today than we could know tomorrow or theoretically know in terms of the universe's available knowledge. 
having a diversified approach between cash, precious metals, equities. This is an approach that regardless of inflation, regardless of deflation, regardless of return to growth in a business cycle, you're well prepared for. But again, that requires humility. Wall Street would have you believe you can know with great assurance and put all of your eggs in that singular basket and you will be a winner. And again, that's the bias towards equities. Now, of course, they diversify the portfolio between small cap, large cap, mid cap, value, growth, all of these things which are supposed to be diversification, but they're still within the same pea patch. They're still the same deal. Patience, humility, diligence, hard work. When you add time to the equation, you're putting the probabilities of success as an investor in your favor. If that's something that we can encourage you to consider, a reappraisal. Stop, slow down, listen, read, consider. Whether it is, as we discussed Vaclav Havel earlier, the political machinations which we have in front of us this election cycle and into the next three or four years, the major structural changes which need to take place not only in the economy but in D.C. from a policy standpoint, these are things that we need to stop, reflect on, consider, make wise decisions not run headlong into the next headline. Okay, that is imperative. And again, this is simply an employment to slow down, regardless of the area of life we're talking about. What character do you want instilled in your children? What kind of intimacy do you want to see reflected in the relationship with your wife? What kind of success do you anticipate in your business ventures or your investment projections? How do you get that done? Reverse engineer that to the greatest degree that you can. Slow down enough to create that concept of the ideal and move backward to the real-time decisions which you can make today to set that in motion. Well, and David, what we're talking about, too, is you are going to need counsel in various areas that will be also envisioning that same ideal. It's very important. If you watch TV and see Kramer on TV and you think, you know, he doesn't necessarily represent this ideal that we're talking about, then don't give your money to Kramer. Okay, if you look at who your kids are running around with and you think that doesn't really represent the ideal that we're working towards as a family, then that needs to be intervened on. And so I think probably none of us are islands. We have to make sure that we choose our counselors wisely. Wouldn't you say a worldview perspective that matches is, is one of the most important elements of course and, and let me just illustrate you know mary catherine and i feel very strongly about marriage and the strength of, of a couple defining defining the direction of family and ultimately of our culture and you know, so locally there's there's a couple that's coming in from california just one person in this equation not two has spent 40,000 hours in the counseling room. This is someone who has seen it all, heard it all, in terms of the wisdom that they bring to how do you make for a stronger family. You know what? We want everyone in this community to benefit from their wise counsel. We want marriages all around us to benefit and support us. Because you've tested it, and it worked. And we'd like to see others take a vision, which, again, where do you want? This is not just about finances and, and an asset allocation model. This is all of life. If you cannot see the end from the beginning, what path are you on? Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.